Hello everyone, my name's Hooten and welcome to the GenX Analytics YouTube channel. Today we're going to be going into some of the largest hacks that have happened in the crypto history. Um, some of the hacks have been absolutely huge and very big numbers and we're going to sort of go into some of these hacks today sort of detailing uh, what happened sort of the the events maybe leading up to it and then sort of the aftermath as well um, whether some of these companies are still around or not it's an interesting episode i would say for this one a bit of a dark topic to uh to go through i suppose because i mean a lot of people did lose money from some of these hacks and there have been a lot of hacks in crypto and as small as some of them might look it's still a lot of money at the end of the day so sit back relax and enjoy it's so the first um big hack and it's the largest to date that we're going to go into is poly network uh, a total of 610 million dollars was stolen from poly network during the hack and we're sort of going to go into a bit of detail as to what happened there so yeah as i was saying before this is one of the largest hacks in the entire crypto history and it's got a bit of a bittersweet ending i would say so stay tuned poly network is a cross-chain interoperability protocol and it aims to sort of build out um, this bridging type system um, for the Web3 ecosystem. Now, they've integrated over 20 different blockchains, uh, including the large ones such as Ethereum, um, Polygon, Avalanche, BSC. They're just to name a few of them. Uh, the protocol has enabled cross-chain asset transfers over $15 billion and the TVL is currently over $500 million. And most of the TVL does come from the Ethereum chain. In August of 2021, so pretty recent, uh, hackers attacked the Poly Network by exploiting a vulnerability between contract calls. Poly Network issued a tweet explaining that they had been hacked and they released the hackers' public wallets onto Twitter. So I will post a screenshot of the hackers' wallets and you can see just, just the transactions that were made. Uh, they urged companies to freeze assets that were in that wallet and they shortly followed that tweet with another tweet uh, asking the hacker to contact them to return the funds that were stolen. And weirdly enough, the hacker did just that. The hacker decided to contact Poly Network uh, and arranged to start returning some of the stolen funds. The hackers then claimed that the exploit that they did was just for fun. Uh, and they also said it was just to help secure the Polygon network. And they want to do that just by revealing the vulnerabilities that it might have. After Poly Network started receiving these tokens, and they started referring to the hackers as Mr. White Hat and offered to reward them with a $500,000 bug bounty and also a job position of the chief security advisor to Poly Network. And that was done as a strategy to ensure the safe return of the rest of the funds. On August 25th, the Poly Network exploit was finally ended with the hackers releasing the last of the private key. Uh, plenty of users on Twitter weren't happy uh, with the offer of the chief security advisor being sent to the hacker, uh, as many just thought the hacker's excuse was to just take the heat off of them, really. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about the bug bounties and uh, why they would return funds a little bit later on. Uh, it might seem like a stupid thing to do, but there is a sort of a good reason behind it. But yeah, stay tuned for that. I'll, I'll go over that just a bit later on. The second largest crypto hack in history is CoinCheck and a total of around $532 million was stolen. Uh, CoinCheck is a popular Japanese exchange in which $532 million in NEM tokens were stolen in January 2018. Again, pretty recent. Uh, the hackers exploited the hot wallet as the tokens were stored there. NEM developers were able to recognize where the stolen funds went and so they were able to mark these coins as stolen. There had been speculations that the tokens were being traded on the dark web and over 30 people were arrested in connection to around $100 million of these stolen funds being traded. And some of those that were arrested were also accused of selling the tokens on legal exchanges. CoinCheck explained that the reason the hackers were successful was because they had a shortage of staff at the time. Uh, CoinCheck did a very good deed after the hack though and they did reimburse all those affected um, by the hack. So every user eventually got their money back. I believe that this might have prompted other exchanges to then do the same in the future. Uh, for example, when Binance got hacked, um, they ended up reimbursing anyone that got affected as well. And a lot of exchanges have been building up a separate sort of insurance type fund just in case any hacks happen in the future. They always have a fund to then reimburse any of the users that might be affected. And I feel like something as big as this, you know, CoinCheck being hacked for such an amount uh, might have prompted you know, the other bigger exchanges to do the same. Uh, CoinCheck is still widely used in Japan today, meaning that the customers still feel safe. I suppose knowing that if CoinCheck ever did get hacked again, uh, they will most likely see <laughs> their funds returned. Uh, if they've done it the first time, I'm sure they'll do it a second time in terms of the funds being returned. And one thing to, to know is Poly Network is still a usable platform as well. It's uh, still running to this day. Um, but the next hack we're going to talk about isn't still running anymore. And the hack we are going to be talking about is, of course, Mt. Gox. 
It was one of the biggest uh, hacks in the entire crypto history, and especially because of how long ago it was as well. I mean, the price of Bitcoin was much lower. Um, so if you look at how much was stolen, uh, the value of it today is astronomical. So Mt. Gox was a crypto exchange that handled the majority of um, Bitcoin trades. I think it was over 70% at the time. A couple of years before the hack, uh, the website was actually used for Magic the Gathering and it was for trading cards and it was an exchange for trading all these cards. Eventually it turned into an exchange where people could trade Bitcoin. About a year after the change from Magic the Gathering, it was then sold to another developer uh, who then unfortunately took on all the risk of, uh, of hacks in the future. So we're going to go through a bit of a timeline as to what happened. So in 2011 is when it all really started. Um, there was a security breach that caused a leak in the Mt. Gox user base, uh, which led to the theft of Bitcoin uh, shortly after that. And the same year, 2011, uh, suspicious trading activity caused a flash crash of the Bitcoin price from $17 to 0 0.01, so one cent. Uh, and then at the, the very bottom of that, a large trade was, took place of 261,383 Bitcoin. Uh, was executed at one cent, which meant that multiple exchanges, including Mt. Gox, experienced a lot of volatility. Uh, the CEO of Mt. Gox then launched an investigation and determined that the attacker had used an old auditing account uh, and shut the Mt. Gox website down. 2012 seemed pretty quiet as I was doing some research. Uh, it didn't seem like too much really happened. Uh, it was in 2013 up until 2014 where things really kicked off. Uh, in 2013, more problems arose. Uh, CoinLab had filed a $75 million lawsuit against Mt. Gox, alleging a breach of contract. CoinLabs was supposed to handle all of Mt. Gox's North American customers, but this never occurred. In the same year, it was also discovered that the company had not registered its business uh, for a license with the US government as a money transmitter. This led to a warrant to seize money from Mt. Gox's subsidiary account. Uh, in total, $5 million were seized. In the same year, Mt. Gox announced that it had incurred significant losses due to credit and deposits that had not been fully cleared. This was then followed shortly after by them announcing that any new deposits would no longer be credited until the funds were fully transferred. A few months later, existing customers were experiencing very long delays of cash withdrawals. They were taking weeks and in some cases they were taking months just to get cash out of the exchange. In early 2014, Mt. Gox then suspended all Bitcoin withdrawals. They then found that the root cause could have been transaction malleability and double spending. Uh, customers at the time were still experiencing huge delays in withdrawals. Protests actually began outside of their head office. And for security reasons, Mt. Gox decided to move their head office to a, another location. About two to three weeks after the initial suspension of Bitcoin withdrawals, Mt. Gox then suspended all trading on their platforms. And then the website went down. Uh, the company had stated that it had lost around 750,000 of the customer's Bitcoin and around 100,000 Bitcoin of its own. And this was valued at around 470 million at the time. Over the years and up until this date, there are still ongoing investigations uh, and attempts to refund customers that did lose the Bitcoin. Uh, in 2015, a security firm doing an investigation on the hack suggested that most of the Bitcoin was stolen from Mt. Gox's hot wallet, which started the theft in around 2011. So the platform launched in 2010. In 2011, that's when the hot wallet was slowly over time um, drained, I suppose. Just small thefts over time that led to over 750,000 of customers Bitcoin stolen, which is just a crazy amount to think about. If you think about how much one Bitcoin is worth today, you can see that the, the number is astronomical. Um, there are still lawsuits from people that have lost a lot of money as well. Yeah, it's still an ongoing story, um, but for the purpose of the video, I've not gone through every single detail, just sort of an overview about what's uh, what's occurred. I find it crazy that Mt. Gox was originally Magic the Gathering <laughs> an exchange for that. It's crazy. I was reading up about it and yeah, it was originally Magic the Gathering, uh, I think it was in 2007. And then um, it, the guy didn't really have an, enough time to run the exchange, so he just closed the website, but still held on to the domain. And then he read about Bitcoin and decided to make his own Bitcoin exchange. And then he decided to then sell that to another developer. So I do suppose it's a good job that um, the guy actually got out. He kind of got out. Um, he ended up still having equity within the company. Um, but he wasn't held liable for any of the, the hacks that have happened over the course of the years. Uh, the next uh, biggest hack that I want to talk about is Wormhole. Wormhole happened this year, um, just over a month ago now. Um, so it is very, very recent. 
It happened at the start of February 2022. Um, wormhole is a project that enables users to bridge assets from one blockchain to another. The attack came from a security flaw that had a fix for it. Uh, the fix was posted on GitHub, but it hadn't actually been deployed to the protocol yet. Um, this meant that the hacker was able to mint 120,000 wormhole wrapped Ethereum. Uh, if you're wondering what wrapped Ethereum is, uh, it's basically just pegged to the price of Ethereum and just having it wrapped means that it enables interoperability between other blockchains. So the idea is that you'd wrap your Ethereum, you'd send it to another blockchain and then unwrap it on the other end. So the hacker was able to bridge 93,750 of the wrapped Ethereum tokens from the Solana ecosystem or blockchain uh, to the Ethereum blockchain. He then decided to withdraw the unwrapped Ethereum. Node operators uh, then temporarily stopped relaying messages and upgraded the contract to fix this vulnerability. Uh, later on, Wormhole announced that all lost funds would be backed by unwrapped Ethereum. And that was with the help of another firm called Jump Crypto. They then released a $10 million bug bounty that was issued for exploit details and a white hat agreement in exchange for returning all the lost funds. Again, this is another thing about returning the lost funds. You might be asking yourself, why, why would you want to return the $320 million you've just stolen and only receive $10 million back? For some people, that might not make sense. And I'm sort of going to explain why now. The biggest incentive here for the hackers to actually return these funds is that they are receiving $10 million of clean cash, essentially. Not clean cash, but clean funds, clean crypto. So it means that they, they can just freely trade it um, with other cryptocurrencies. They can move it between different exchanges and it's not going to be blacklisted. Whereas the $320 million is going to be extremely hard to do anything with because you're going to have some protocols that can blacklist or will blacklist and basically you know stop you from making transactions. If you try and get to any exchanges, a lot of the exchanges now come with Know Your Customer, the KYC. So you're then tied to the hack, essentially, if you try and do anything with those funds. Uh, and you're just constantly tracked by all these different companies, just so they know where the stolen money has gone. So I'd say it's a lot more stressful for the hacker to try and keep the $320 million and when they could just give that back and just receive $10 million freely. So I'd say it's a win-win for both parties if they do the route of returning the money. Uh, Wormhole gets back the $320 million that was stolen and the hackers can leave with $10 million of clean, free funds. So there are hundreds of more uh, hacks that we could talk about in today's video, um, but I don't want it to become like a lecture where we sit down and we talk about every single hack. Um, there have been so many, but I've just sort of gone over some of the biggest ones today. If you want me to do another video similar to this where we talk about some more hacks that have happened, then let me know in the comments. Uh, if more hacks do happen of a significant volume, just like Wormhole did in the last couple of months, um, then I will make a separate video about that and sort of, you know, go through and explain what's going on. Um, Wormhole, it, again, is still a usable platform. It's still usable to this day. The only one that I've spoken about that isn't usable is Mt. Gox. I think Mt. Gox did actually have plans to rebuild uh, under some bankruptcy protection but i think the idea was quickly scrapped <laughs> so uh yeah still not usable if you were affected by any of these hacks i would also like to know in the comments uh, if you feel okay to share that sort of information um i've personally not been involved in any of these hacks that i've mentioned today um the only one i could have been affected by really is the binance one but i was uh, i was lucky to have my funds still in the wallet at the time uh, i'm gonna make some more videos um talking about the safety of your own crypto as well sort of doing maybe a wallet comparison, uh, the pros and cons for some of these wallets, just figuring out the best ways to start the crypto that you might have. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for all that. If you enjoyed, leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. I hope you're having a good day wherever you are, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.